He's an expert in deep politics and the impediments to real meaningful democracy. With that, I could keep going on and on. I think I'll just, without further ado, um, introduce Mr. Russ Baker at this time. Help me welcome him to the call. Thank you very much. Thank you, Russ. Good morning. <clears throat> I was all ready to say something about Unitarians, but now I'm wondering how many Unitarians are in the room. How many <laughs> Unitarians are in the room? Okay, enough of you. You know, uh, when, you, when you watch politicians, you know how they always try to pretend that they know you personally, that they are from your particular town and so on? One of my favorite jokes about Hillary Clinton is uh, the Clintons used to, the Bushes did the same thing. They would always claim they were from everywhere because they always had a relative or they had once stopped in a place. And with Hillary Clinton, she was trying to get Jewish votes. and. Um, I think they had made some obscure claim that somebody in her family somewhere had some Jewish connections. A friend of mine is a stand-up comedian used to say, yeah, did you know that about Hillary Clinton and, and Judaism? Yeah. Hillary Clinton's aunt was once married to a guy whose brother-in-law ate a corned beef sandwich. <laughs> so here's mine. Um, I live in New York City, born in California, however, and I lived, I'm proud to say, in San Francisco for several years. Uh, I always like coming to San Francisco. One of the reasons is when I'm in uh, New York and they say, oh, where are you headed? And then I say, oh, well, see, I said, I'm going to LA. And they say, oh. And they say, and then San Francisco. And they say, oh, great. <laughs> so that's always fun for me. And, 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 and of course, Unitarians, I mean, who doesn't love a Unitarian? I mean, Unitarians are always seem to me the greatest people. They're always very kind and uh, well-meaning and thoughtful. Now, I'm sure you're going to say, well, I know if you aren't, but my experience is they're awfully good people. Uh, I was actually thinking of printing up some buttons to bring them that said, have you hugged a Unitarian today? <laughs> so I, I didn't get a chance to do that, but speaking of hugs, I think we all need hugs right about now because uh, aren't you feeling a little overwhelmed with the world? I know that I am, uh, and it always takes me a little bit of an effort to get out of bed each morning. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons uh, uh, that we feel overwhelmed is because so much stuff is thrown at us all the time. Um, but unfortunately, the stuff that's thrown at us is not material that we can do anything with. This is a kind of a, a big issue for me these days, how uh, we're given information that, it, A, I, I wonder if we should really even call it information, and B, if it's anything useful, uh, comprehensible, or actionable. Uh, and there, it seems to me that there are kind of two uh, things going on. Um, I, the, the, some of you got the, the uh, theme uh, that, that you were told that I was going to speak about. The other one, I think, uh, that, that uh, they mentioned on KGO last night was the news you don't get. Um, and uh, it seems to me that there are really uh, two areas we might focus on here. Uh, one is briefly, I only want to do it uh, very briefly, is the presidential election because I think that's all about all the time we should give to it. Uh, and then the other is the tabloidization of life. Um, presidential election, you know, it's funny, people, when they hear that I'm a journalist, they say, oh, you must be really excited. 2012, you'll be busy. I say, well, why wouldn't I always be busy? And, and why would I be more busy in 2012? And of course, if you really think about it, what, what are these presidential elections except uh, kind of bizarro contests? Um, and, and, and it seems, if you think back to uh, a time when, when the nominees were people like Franklin Roosevelt and Wendell Wilkie, uh, uh, either of whom would have been probably more thoughtful than maybe anybody in the race this year for any party. Uh, and that tells you a lot. And, and so, but journalism, unfortunately, uh, responds to situations where there is a kind of a, 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 a dramatic tension. And so uh, they like the horse race. And boy, don't we see that every week, right? I can't keep track of them. I don't know about you, the, uh, what caucus is up and uh, who's where and how many points they have and so forth. And, and then you wonder, well, what does this actually have to do with the price of bread? Um, and, and, and the answer is nothing. Um, but what, what happens is we have what, what I call a bandwidth. We have a, a certain amount of sort of capacity to absorb information. Uh, we're all busy with other things. We only have so much free time. And so um, that free time, it's very important, that free time. 
And it's very important how we choose to spend that time uh, as citizens uh, in, in educating ourselves. And I am struck by this constant barrage, A, the presidential campaign, and the B, B is the tabloidization. And every week, and I'm not saying these stories don't have some importance, but what are we talking about this week? We're talking about this young fellow who was killed in Florida. But if you think about it, it's not the only thing going on in the world. That's not the only person being killed, and yet that's the only killing that we're talking about. And it fills up. If you turn on your television, uh, MSNBC and CNN and NPR and so on, that's all they're talking about. And this distresses me greatly because if you start trying to talk to somebody about something else, they'll say, no, no, no I don't have time. I've got to go. And then think about that. Think about the consequences when all of us are focused every week. Uh, the week before, uh, it was uh, the, the tragedy in a, 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 a dorm in, in Rutgers, a young student who uh, was gay, his roommate uh, was, was spying on him. Uh, the week before, I, I can't even keep track of these, Rush Limbaugh with, this, uh, with the cons uh, contraception and so on. It's not that contraception is not important. It's not that uh, uh, the, the rights of this young gay man is not important. It's not that, 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 that the Trayvon Martin, that the tragedy is not important in and of itself. But th what happens is they get exploded out of all proportion and no uh, meaningful action comes out of them. And with the, with the Trayvon Martin case, the only thing I could possibly think that could come out of that that would be anything really useful would be an honest discussion about guns in America. And that is not going to happen. You l listen to all the coverage. Do you ever hear them talking about gun laws? I don't. And, and so this, this bothers me because, because it's ultimately, in a perverse kind of way, it ends up being a kind of a, uh, it's, it, it, it becomes a kind of a filler. It becomes a kind of an entertainment in an awful way. And so I'm very, very concerned about that. Um, and so, um, you know, but we let the media determine what we talk about. We really do. We don't set our own agenda. I, one of the things I'm struck by is that the folks I meet who, who understand the most about what's going on in this country are not uh, in the elites. Paradoxically, I suspect there are more people in this room right now who actually have a deeper understanding of American history than the people that you watch on television. And that's an interesting thought because, you see, the, the so-called chattering class, the people who uh, we turn to who have all of the right credentials, the right degrees from the right schools and the right you know, so, uh, resume and so forth, uh, many of them don't have the time to read. And I've had conversations with U.S. senators who said, gee, you know, I've heard about your book. It sounds really interesting. Could you give me a one-minute summary of it? <laughs> because, and they say, I don't have time to read books. And I said, well, y y you know, we did send it to your chief of staff. And he said, yeah, I don't think he has time to read books either. And I was talking to a guy recently who works in Washington, and he said, you know, a lot of the elected officials, frankly, are not very smart. He said, there really aren't. And, and, but at least they have staff, because the staff's somewhat smarter. Um, but, you know, this is distressing, and so we actually, we here in this room, we have a very, very important function, which is we have to read these books that they're not going to read. And we have to sort of absorb and digest and analyze and decide what, of course, what we believe, what we don't believe, which books we think are good, which aren't. Uh, and then we need to share that with other people. So I'm going to, uh, uh, when we wrap up, I'm going to try to come full circle and talk a little bit about the importance of that uh, activity, the activity of, of us being... Uh, sort of the curators, if you want, for the rest of the people in our lives. It's a very, very important function. Um, the more I watch the media, the more I'm convinced that they, they want to create a, a sort of a fantasy. You know, you know this idea of uh, uh, America is this great and good country, waving flags, uh, singing patriotic songs. Uh, every, basically, we, we all are uh, gentlemen and gentle ladies, and we all politely disagree, but basically we're one great, strong country. How many times have you heard that from politicians? Uh, and how many times do you hear that when the banker is taking your home away from you? Yeah. Suddenly it's gone, right? It's only, it's only invoked selectively, usually when they want your children to go and die in some foreign country for some war that they can't properly explain, or perhaps a war where they tell you different reasons for going at different points. And then after a while, they don't even give you any reasons anymore. And then, of course, there's the oversimplification of everything and the glorification of these icons who appear. This, maybe anybody read Three Cups of Tea 
about Afghanistan this, by this Mortensen. And do you remember the New York Times uh, columnist made him out to be a great guy, and Oprah held his hand, I guess, and so forth. Uh, and then only belatedly we discovered that uh, oh, uh, a lot of those schools the money was going to didn't exist, or the schools hadn't heard of him or gotten any money. Uh, the village that he uh, uh, ended up in, where the villagers uh, saved his life, they said, never seen this guy at all. Uh, yeah, and then the New York Times columnists didn't properly apologize. They said, well, you know, let's wait and see. Let's take a wait and see attitude here about the guy whose house that I go over to for lunch. So, yeah. And then this charity, remember this viral, have you heard about this viral video about invisible children and Joseph Coney and uh, Uganda and so forth? A horrible the warlord who is butchered many, many people, but he's been doing it for decades, and suddenly it's the latest thing on the internet, and very briefly, everybody's deeply interested in this, uh, and then uh, there's some charity comes out of nowhere, and the next thing we know, the man who runs the charity is naked on the streets of San Diego, vandalizing cars and hospitalized. So I think we need to be a little bit more careful in uh, the heroes that we choose. Uh, and then there's the liberal versus conservative thing, which I'll be honest with you, I increasingly don't buy it. I don't buy it. Because, you know, most of us are suffering. We just identify different culprits. We, we, we see things differently. We're, we're brainwashed differently. Uh, and, and one of the things we're trying to do through the work that I do at whowhatwhy.com is to get away from that left-right paradigm and to start talking to people about actual circumstances and to try to identify why certain circumstances exist. I become increasingly troubled by that, that sort of that, 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 that battle, if you will, which I think the media promotes. You know, I'm talking about the, 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 the Occupy movement against Tea Party and so on and so forth. And, but ultimately, it's all the, the bottom sector of society, at least financially and in terms of, uh, in terms of power, that are at, uh, put at each other's throats, usually over hot button social issues. Isn't that really what it is? Um, and you know, you, if you think about it, you have to understand it. I mean, the people who, people who care about, uh, about uh, contraception or a woman's right uh, to determine uh, what she does with her body, and other people who I think legitimately uh, have this, this uh, concern about uh, the unborn. I mean, you know, instead of vilifying either side, you can understand that people probably come to that sincerely. And so if we could get away from that kind of you know, pitched battle in the streets between ourselves, we could focus on where the real power is. And that's really what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the real power. And the real power is a country where um, uh, 400 people have about as much money as the bottom 300 million. And then you say to yourself, well, how could that be in a democracy? How, how would that work? Could, would we willingly uh, uh, tolerate that? Would we, would we willingly uh, work our whole lives in jobs where we were told we would get a pension uh, and, or we would get our Social Security or we would get uh, whatever it was we were told we would get? Uh, we, we, we bought a home and we were told as long as we uh, did our job and were good citizens, we'd get to keep all this. And then in the end, it's all taken away. I mean, it, it seems like something's wrong, doesn't it? Something, I mean, really deeply wrong with it. Um, and so that is, is something that has tremendously uh, interested me, this notion that um, we're basically told that here's how power works. There are three branches of government, and we vote, right? And that's it. But what they don't talk about, what, what's the unofficial branch that they don't talk about? Media. Well, the media is one, and what's the other one? Corporations, right, right. You know, I mean, how could you not talk about them? That's everything. I, most, most Americans work for corporations. It's kind of like uh, uh, their life. You know, they, they meet their mate uh, at the, you know, the, the, the Irish bar that everybody goes to from work. And uh, on the weekend, and what's their charity? You know, they put on a T-shirt with the name of their bank, right? And then they go jogging for some health issue that gives the bank all of this free publicity. It makes them look a lot better than they are. I mean, we don't examine these things. And this is important. To me, that's what real media would do. It would talk constantly about these things. Of course, you'd have a problem because who sponsors your program? Um, and that's why whowhatwhy.com is a nonprofit. That's why we are struggling to make a go of it with the support of ordinary folks. We actually set it up on our site so people can sign up to give $10 a month or whatever they think they can give. Uh, 
to me, the problem is that the real story is blocked. And um, I'd like to talk about that for a minute. What is the real story? Uh, the father of, modern, of the modern public relations industry, Edward Bernays, anybody heard of him? A lot of you, okay. This is a, quite an unusual and well-informed crowd. Uh, he wrote in his seminal book, Propaganda, and I'm going to quote from him, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government which is the true ruling power of our country. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind, who harness old social forces and contrive new ways to bind and guide the world. Now this man was for that. He was part of that. He was explaining how it works. So whenever you talk about invisible government, unseen powers, and people say to you, you're nuts, start wondering who's nuts. How can you not see these things? There is a, I don't know if I have it here or not, there's a wonderful quote from the, from the, um, the I think I don't have it, but the, the, the um, the man who made Dr. Strangelove, uh, there was a, um, some, um, sorry, wait a minute. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, the man who wrote Dr. Strangelove, excuse me. What was his name? Terry Southern. Terry Southern, thank you. What a crowd, love it. I listened to you last night. <laughs> oh, you heard me say it last night. That's not fair. That's not fair. Okay, Terry Southern. <laughs> Uh, and and, and uh, after the Kennedy assassination, one man no, of no great fame s d put together an, um, a questionnaire, and he mailed it out to all these famous and powerful people in America, and he said, what do you think of the Kennedy assassination? What do you think of the Warren Commission report? And Terry S Southern uh, wrote back to him, and he said, you know, this is the most staggering thing. It's, it, the, the Warren report itself is such an insult to people's intelligence, it's almost as if they actually believe that not a single, I'm paraphrasing here, not a single person in America actually read the unabridged version. To which my comment is, that's probably right. You know? <laughs> That stuff is just sitting there, and uh, the background to my book, Family of Secrets, uh, is that I uh, was training journalists uh, in the former Yugoslavia. This is typical of the U.S. government. I got a gig. They, they said, could you go over there and help them have democracy and have a good media? You know, I, I don't know why they don't hire us to do that here. Uh, but I went, <laughs> I went over there, and, and I worked there for a while, and the stay turned it from, turned it from a few weeks into a year and a half, because it was interesting, and I was able to do that. Uh, but then uh, we had the run-up to the war with Iraq, and I, I, I just thought, gee, this seems strange. You know, I, just, I don't buy this. Something, something's really wrong with this thing. I think these guys actually want to go to war, I mean, despite what they're saying. And so, uh, but the problem was that I'm American, and so people started giving me a hard time. You're American. It's your fault. It's your country. You blame us for Milosevic. Why aren't you responsible for Bush? Which is a very good question. Uh, and I try to explain, well, you see, our country's divided, and like half of us don't like those people, and half of us do, or are misguided, or misinformed, or whatever it is. And they say, well, yeah, but you could say that about any country. And then I thought about that. All these other countries, Argentina and Guatemala and Germany and everybody, having deep con profound conversations about their country and what had gone wrong. And then I thought, do we ever do that? Do we ever have a national commission to figure out what's wrong with us? I don't remember any, certainly. We, we do have panels. Remember those? The 9-11 Commission, the Iran-Contra, the this, the that. And of course, if, if you recall, they never get to the bottom of anything because that's their job, to not get to the bottom of anything. So, but I would love to have a real candid dialogue about these things. And so I, when I, I thought, you know, I better get back to the U.S. and at least do my part. And it was 2004 now. And I thought, I, I'm going to do some research into George W. Bush, who's on his way to re-election. Because I was thinking, why is this guy on his way to re-election? I, I was surprised that he ever got elected president in the first place. Now it's four years later, and they're going to re-elect him, and he started a war that 
turns out to have been phony from the get-go, and, and you know, what's happening here? And then I saw, well, oh, this is interesting. The Democrats are suggesting that Bush himself skipped out on military service during World War II. Oh, he won't survive that one. And then, oh my gosh, look, the Democrats are going to nominate a bona fide Vietnam War hero who's a, who, who became a peacenik. Boy, now Bush is really sunk, right? There's no way any rational, sane country would not know what to do in a situation like that. Well, boy, was I wrong. And uh, then I saw how uh, the Bush's, Bush's people basically kind of obfuscated and confused everybody. And somehow the whole question of what happened to him, two years of his military service, he just disappeared. That question disappeared. And then John Kerry started having problems. Remember the swift vote bet veterans for the truth? for truth, uh, and then John Kerry, they started questioning his heroism, which I, I think it was a real fact that he was in Vietnam on a, on a swift boat in an incredibly dangerous situation, but they managed to poke holes in that. And I thought, boy, you know, there's some kind of apparatus here which is pretty darn good, pretty darn good. They are really good. They work with nothing, and they come out on top. <laughs> That's the story, folks. People who work with nothing who come out on top, they read their Edward Bernays. And so this is tied into all this stuff, our bandwidth, how we spend all of our time talking about these kind of Oprah-style stories instead of focusing on who has the power and how and why. Um, and so, so this concerned me. Now, now, with Family of Secrets, I just decided I wanted to figure out, I was finding all these strange things about the Bush family when I was doing my, my reporting in 2004, and I thought, there's got to be more of a story here. How did this man become the President of the United States? at all, and then why did he do the things that he did? Because it all seems strange to me. I have to say that is, I think, the best kind of journalism where you go in with a question and not an answer. A question and not an answer. And so I began traveling the country, meeting with all kinds of people, saying to them, what's the deal here? What is the deal here? I talked to friends of the Bush family. I talked to people who'd been up in battle against them, who'd been destroyed by them. I talked to journalists, I talked to uh, labor organizers, I talked to lawyers in Texas, I talked to all kinds of people. And I said, what's going on here? And do you know, people made light of this, as if it was funny. Oh, I don't know. So I said, well, how did he become president? They said, well, I don't know, he raised a lot of money. Well, why did those people give the money to him instead of to somebody else? I mean, there are Republicans who are articulate and thoughtful, and you may or may not agree with them, but they love their country and they seem to have earned their living fairly honestly and so forth. And so I thought, why, you know, why him in particular? Well, nobody could answer it. And nobody was interested in the question. That's amazing, isn't it? Not to be interested in the person who ran our country for eight years and about all of the things that he did. And so as I worked on what became Family of Secrets, uh, the years passed. I spent five years on that, and, and, and people said, you know, your book sh it should have come out earlier uh, when he was running. And I said, well, th we, wouldn't we wouldn't have known what he was going to be. And they said, well, then you should have had it out when he was running for re-election. I said, but, you know, there were other books that came out then. Uh, uh, and they said, well, we don't care about him anymore. And so Family of Secrets came out basically the end of 08, the beginning of 09, and we had the biggest problem with the media because people said, well, we're moving on. We don't care about him anymore. We have Barack Obama. We have hope. We have reform. Everything has changed. And I said, I, you know, he seems to be a decent guy, I guess, but I'm not so sure everything has changed. I don't see how that would work. Because those guys are there, what, four years, eight years, or in the case of a John Kennedy or an Abe Lincoln or whatever, a foreshortened. Uh, but, but who's always there? Who's always there? Big money is always there, aren't they? And then all these people in these secret organizations we don't understand anything about. Who here knows very intimately the history and the actual internal origins of the FBI? Somebody's going like this. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Who knows the actual origins and the reason for the creation of the CIA and who did it? And the same guy's going like this. Okay. <laughs> he may have a stutter. I don't know. <laughs> um, Okay, so I didn't know these things, even though I thought I did. And in the course of reporting Family of Secrets, I learned all these things that absolutely blew my mind. They changed my understanding of almost everything and caused a woman to call 
KGO, which I was on last night. Uh, how many of you heard me on KGO last night? Wow, a lot of you. Okay. Uh, it was one of the final callers, and she said, you're talking about these wheels within wheels and these sinister things. And she said, how do I know you're not just making this all up? You know, wh wh where do you get that from? And then I, 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 I sort of said, well, we have 60 pages of footnotes in the book. It's almost all from actual documents and correspondence and minutes and so forth. It's all there. It's all there. All you have to do is ask, who, who did create the CIA? And then you find out that one of the key people was a guy named Robert Lovett. And then you, find, you, know, you say, oh, I never heard of Robert Lovett. Oh, he was uh, 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 in the Pentagon under Harry Truman, under a Democrat, and he was an investment banker. And who was his business partner? A guy named Prescott Bush. And he was the grandfather of George W. and the father of George H. W. Okay? And who was another partner in the firm? Avril Harriman. And Avril Harriman was an advisor to uh, Johnson and Kennedy and, 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 and Truman and Roosevelt. Uh, oh, and who was another person there? Oh, it was this Republican, and he was in the Eisenhower administration. And Prescott Bush was uh, Dwight Eisenhower's golfing partner. And so you start going, well, that's really weird. I, what, what's the name of the firm? Brown Brothers Harriman? Uh, I'm not sure I've heard of that. Well, isn't that interesting that their partners are in every administration, every single administration? And this is what journalism needs to be doing. It needs to be saying, who are these people? Who's Tim Geithner? How does he end up, why does Obama appoint these people? You see, because they say, well, he appoints them because they're the most knowledgeable or something. Well, here's my question. How does Barack Obama know who's the most knowledgeable person? Personally speaking, I'm not knowledgeable enough about economics to know who the most knowledgeable person is. Although I can tell you this, it seems to me that, that in this country, the possibilities and in the world are extremely wide, aren't they? Of what actually could be done theoretically. And then I wonder, why is the full range of options between the Democrats and the Republicans, uh, if you're on the right, it's uh, Morgan Stanley, and if you're on the left, it's Goldman Sachs. I mean, you know, why, is, uh, 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 why does nobody go to jail no matter what they do? Why are the bills, the laws written in such a way that what, what, what rich people do is just never illegal? And what poor people do when they're hungry is illegal. You know, how do all these things work? And so to me, that's real journalism. Those are the questions we need to ask. Um, how are we doing on time? Thirty-five minutes, including Q and A. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, I mean, I have to tell you, I do some of these radio shows. You ever listen to Coast to Coast, uh, the late late night radio show? It's all over the country. Uh, they have had me on there for four hours, and we ran out of time. So this is hard for me. This is, this is hard for me. I usually try to look and see if anybody's falling asleep, and then I know to wrap it up. So. There's a story that needs to be told. Um, Hollywood used to try to tell some of these stories. We talked about uh, uh, Dr. Strangelove, uh, the Manchurian Candidate, um, Seven Days in May, Failsafe, some of these movies from years ago. And then they changed and they became less creative, but still they were trying to be sort of docudramas like a, a, uh, the, one, um, um, the one about Three Mile Island, um, um, your, uh, yeah, China Syndrome, Norma Ray, I mean, you could probably name others, you know, about a coal miner's daughter, what have you, you know, trying to uh, address issues in, in American life and, and in the world. Um, and I just spoke in LA to a gathering of people from the entertainment industry, and I said, look, I mean, really, what, are you, what is your industry doing now? I mean, they're, they're, they're all about superheroes. I mean, literally, they have one superhero after another, and you have to think about what's happening to our country and our mentality that we all want to escape to people with magical powers. Uh, and again, I see this as sort of sinister because actually you don't need superheroes because we're all superheroes in a way. I mean, we all have powers. And people always say to me, well, what can I do? You know, I, I love what you say, but in the end, I, I feel a little discouraged because what can one person do? And I say, well, actually, everything in the world has been done by one person, hasn't it? Every vaccine, uh, uh, every uh, uh, article of clothing, every car, every new uh, advance, every stirring speech, it was all one person. I mean, what, what, what is accomplished by... Uh, uh, committees. I mean, not a lot. I mean, who, who really wants to go to meetings, per se? You know? <laughs> they tell you in business now, try to have as few meetings as possible. So it's not committee, it's individuals. It could be individuals working together in a case like this. 
Uh, so, uh, movies. A um, couple of movies I like because they raised some of these issues more recently. Anybody seen The Truman Show? Jim Carrey, where he belatedly realizes, I don't know if I should spoil it, maybe you want to rent it, but anyway, he realizes that his life is uh, it's, it's, a, it's a charade, it's a facade. Uh, another one would be The Matrix. Um, which is the notion that we're all sort of hooked up to this machine and we, we can't realize that we're living this sort of virtual reality. And I think we are. I think we are. Some of us, you know, unplug from the machine or what is it, swallow the red pill. And then, and I think the kind of people who are here today probably do. And so we have a special responsibility because we are sort of the vanguard. We're, we're the people who have to uh, do that extra work. And, and you know, I, I've been, lately, one of my favorite things is going after liberals. And the reason I go after, what, when I say liberals, I'm talking about people who mean well. Um, they, they've got the right bumper stickers on their car. They've, they've got the, you know, the Prius or the, you know, the electric car, maybe, if they want to inconvenience themselves a little bit more. And they mean well. But the reality is that they, most of us, work for what? Corporate law firms. They uh, work at large universities. And whatever they do, we're all part of the system. And when you're part of the system, it's not very pleasant to hear bad news about the thing of which you're part. Most of us may have a little bit of money saved up. Maybe we have it in a, uh, gosh, I sure don't want to look at my mutual fund to see uh, you know, where they put the money. You make a, if you want to make an extra effort, you go with a, you know, what they call a social, socially conscious investing. You can do certain things, can't you? You can, you can compost, you can recycle. You know, we try to do things individually, but the problem is that our whole society is the problem. And so, I find that some people in the, what I call the liberals, they, they really don't want to hear much of this. They want to believe that it's really all we have to do is get the right people into Congress. Um, and, you know, this makes people crazy. One woman said to me, I feel like I'm having a heart attack because every senator is calling me. She lives in L.A. She's wealthy and thoughtful and progressive. But everybody, every, every uh, senator from everywhere in the United States calls her as if she's the only person on earth because they heard that they could get some money from her. And she feels just overwhelmed and exhausted. And she said, I don't know what else I can do. But I said to her, you know, the problem is we've got to unhook you from the machine because it's not that those candidates are bad. You've got some folks running here, around here who are terrific, who are in office, try to do what they can. But the whole system prevents them uh, from getting anything done. And so my sense, and, and I'm moving toward our Q&A section here, is that we need to wake people up. And once people are awakened, they know what to do. And once they know what to do, if we do live in a democracy, if enough of us vote for the right people and there are enough of the right people in there being pressured to do the right thing, that is exactly what they'll do. Remember when Obama said, make me do, what did he say, make me do the right thing? You know, he, he said, get out in the streets. The reality is that presidents are under severe pressure. We don't understand that at all. These guys do not have a lot of power. They are put up there because on their way up they cut deals with all kinds of powerful people and when they, uh, when they do the wrong thing, when they, when they do wrong by them, they get in trouble. Uh, in Family of Secrets, it's not just about the Bushes. I discovered a connection to the rise of the Bush family uh, to the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And this is the kind of thing that you can't say in polite company unless they've read the book or they know enough about my career in journalism. They, they say, uh oh, now it's time to go. Now it's time to leave. This guy is cuckoo. Uh, but you know, we understand very, very little about why things happen in this country. We understand very little. Uh, we see movies about this. Remember where there was some person and then uh, they've been sponsored by a bunch of people and then they try to break free and do their own thing. And the movies tell us in fictionalized format, they say all of the names have been changed or the, you know, it's all fictionalized, right? It's not fictionalized. You cannot be even a CEO. Even CEOs don't have that much power. This is the complexity because they have to answer to people who hold big blocks of stock. And so it is a self-reinforcing system where we're, in a way, we're all victims. I, I used to try to name you know, who the bad guys were, but now I'm not even sure there really are any bad guys per se. And this is why I'm, you know, as much as I'm troubled by things like the phenomenon of the Koch brothers, they're part of a much larger thing. If you think they don't have friends, if you think it's just the two brothers doing the whole thing, it's not. If you think Karl Rove wakes up in the morning and goes, yeah, ha, ha, well, I'm going to you know, screw the people today. You know? I mean, that's not how it works. And it's the whole system, and we have to have a very vigorous conversation about that. So what I've done is two things. I wrote a book, Family of Secrets, 
uh, which I hope you'll read because it's an evergreen. It, it, it's really about what is always going on. I hope you'll read, I hope you'll tell your friends. We also started this nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, whowhatwhy.com. Uh, you can go to the site, you can read it for free. I'm going to start moving toward questions now. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, our goal is what we call pure journalism. That's not to say we don't have opinions, but that it, the goal is, in every case, to try to figure out what really happened. Why was a particular bill proposed? How, where did a candidate come from? Who's behind them? What's going on? To strip the, uh, the facade back and reveal how things really work. Because when we have information, and you know this in your personal lives, when you have good, actionable information, you know what to do about your health, about the state of your home, about your family. It's the same thing with the body politic. If we have good, actionable information and we share it, the great thing about the internet is you can all share what you've learned with other people now. You can multiply your power. You are all empowered to do this. That is the beauty of this new world we're in right now. It's really a very exciting time. I'm glad to be in it. I'm glad to be in it with you. Uh, uh, we have some copies of the book here, uh, and I would be happy to sign them for you. We have a mailing list here uh, for who, what, why. I hope you'll sign up. Um, and if you uh, uh, would like to support us at all financially, uh, it's all tax deductible. You can go to the site and get information for that. If you would like to spread the word, that's very, very valuable. If you have particular skills that you'd like to contribute, we welcome that as well. Uh, it's an exciting time, and I, I, I think uh, the next few years are going to be very, very interesting. If we can get this together, I think there are more of us than there are of them, and uh, let, let's all move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, you've really given a touch on a lot of sensitive subjects to all of us, and I think we're all keeping track of uh, a lot of this every day in the news. Uh, I'd like to get some get started with, uh, and I'll just ask this question. Uh, um, I think where a lot of us see Obama is not that much different than, the, than a lot of the uh, most of the uh, Republican candidates in a lot of ways. And I wonder if you have any kind of vision about what that election is going to look like. You mentioned tabloidization. It seems like it might be uh, just rich with that sort of thing, or are we looking forward to a, uh, uh, what are we looking forward to exactly? I, I think what the system does is it propels everything to, toward the center to where, where the, the choices that we have are almost not choices at all. And this is why it's probably going to be Romney. Um, you may have seen, if you read Who, What, Why, that we did propose a scenario in which there could be a deadlocked Republican convention, in which case the likely nominee of the Republican Party would be Jeb Bush. Uh, this, is, this is real. If, if he is not the nominee this year, it's looking increasingly unlikely. Uh, he probably will be uh, four years from now. So I, I think what we're looking at is, you know, Obama and, and probably Romney are going to have to hew to the center. Romney will start shedding his more radical planks. He'll start talking again about uh, the health care that they had in Massachusetts that he's been denying all these months. American people in the media are tremendously forgiving about this stuff. And so uh, we really, again, and we will not have many choices, and, and that, of course, uh, is the problem. So uh, I, I, I don't see the presidential election as being something that we really want to invest all of our time in, let's put it that way. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. I came a little late, so maybe discussed this uh, earlier, but I have a reflex which put me on guard against you, because when you say the origins of the CIA, you never mention, or maybe you don't believe in, that there was a Soviet threat. And when you mentioned the FBI, you didn't even mention, and maybe you don't believe in, something like organized crime. So right away, by not somehow mentioning them, it seemed like you're in some deep way biased. Could you please comment on that? Sure. Well, I do believe that uh, there was a Soviet threat, although it was very, very complex. And not all of the people there were the same. Uh, Nikita Khrushchev was, was a reformer in his own system and was forced out. So all of these things are very nuanced. It's also important to know that, for example, the same people who created the CIA were secretly doing business with the Soviet Union during all of those years. Uh, they wanted the oil in Baku, Azerbaijan. I could go on and on just to cut to the chase here. It's all very nuanced, and a lot of people 
uh, uh, convince us of things. Uh, the, the, the notion of an external threat is a very powerful tool uh, in keeping us down and keeping us asking questions. It's not to say that there was not some kind of a threat, but you know, there's a threat from the US military itself. Uh, now, as far as you say about the FBI and organized crime, who was the leading person who said there was no organized crime? It was J. Edgar Hoover. He was friends with organized crime. So uh, I think there are a lot of levels to these things. I would like to follow up about um, instead of the Soviet Union now, there is a Chinese threat. And if you look at some of the videos on YouTube from last May, people in Southern California were saying that there were Chinese planes in the air and that, um, well, my father used to listen to uh, right-wing radio down there and they thought the Chinese Navy was buying the terminal, you know, in Long Beach. So um, since China genuinely does feel threatened and contained now, um, I read um, Bush's brain early about Karl Rove and started thinking about, well, who pulls Karl Rove's strings? And then I found a book in the Menlo Park Library called The Shadow Elite, and that professor starts with the Yugoslav War also. Um, and the thing is, if you go back to, um, you know, the, the monarchy, the uh, uh, European royalties and systems, you know, so some of us follow Bilderberg, uh, as well as the 9-11, you know, all those things are, um, are interrelated, and it is hard to get people's minds out of a set which, you know, we're in the belly of the whale, so you've been inculcated in a lot of things you've been told and, and that you absorb. My friends on the left um, give me the credi critical questions about China, which they get out of the biased Western media. So um, uh, I wanted to point out in the shadow of the... Yeah, if you, if you could just get to the question, because we have so many people who want to ask um, Have you heard of Bruce P. Jackson? No. Um, he's the Lockheed Martin um, uh, lobbyist for the Pentagon. And on all the websites, like Global Research in Montreal, um, the nexus is the Treasury and the Pentagon. Okay, I, I think we do have to go to the next question. Thank you. Thank you. If you could, try to keep your questions very, very short, just as a courtesy to everyone no else. Speech. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Questions, not okay. statements. I wanted to ask you, I'm, I'm very um, disconcerted about President Obama's recent actions. For example, him signing the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, H.R. 347, which you spoke about with Nicole Sandler recently. Um, and a lot of the things that he's doing, I realize that presidents are not as powerful as we think they are, and they have to compromise. That's the nature of, of the beast. Um, but I, the things that he's doing now, it seems like he's not compromising. It seems like he... So the question is, does he want to actually want to do these things? Well, my, my question is, is there more to President Obama than we know? Not was he born in Kenya, but does he... <laughs> perhaps maybe have intelligence ties that we're not aware of. Is there more to him than we know? You know, um, I've been told so many stories by individuals who uh, describe when they were young and they were usually at an Ivy League school or something, some older person would uh, invite them to lunch or something and say, what do you think about doing with your career? Um, you seem like a promising person. And again, these are first-hand experiences. I myself lived in a place I later realized was a kind of a recruiting center. Um, you know, the intelligence apparatus is vast. It's vast. And we, we act like it doesn't exist. Uh, we talk about this gentleman talked about the Soviet threat. But I mean, th yes, there are all of those things. You're right. There are all those things. But we don't examine our own house. We don't examine our own house. We know nothing about these things. I talk to members of Congress. They don't know anything about these things. So uh, there is no question that there is a constant recruitment effort for talented and promising up-and-coming people uh, that is part of their mandate. I mean, it's not a, a crazy notion. It's what they're supposed to be doing. I cannot answer that question. I do know that, and you may have read this, that when Obama was at Columbia, he worked for a company that was a contractor for the CIA. Now, that company, it could have been a completely benign thing. A lot of things are benign. Um, a lot of us do think, some people may think that, you know, when I was in Yugoslavia, they thought I was a spy, and I wasn't. So we don't want to read things into everything where they aren't there. But I would say this, you don't get to the top uh, unless you play ball on a lot of different things over the years. 
Uh, and you know all of this uh, Wall Street complaining about Obama being a socialist. You think they believe he's a socialist? I mean, that's just a game. That's just a game because he's. It, it, when you call somebody something they're not, you force them to move even more in the opposite direction. So that's all I can tell you. In 1986, I became best friends with the daughter of E. Howard Hunt, mm. and uh, her godfather was William F. Buckley Jr. And uh, in the course of our friendship, she told me lots of horror stories about her father and, of course, about Libby and all the people at that time. And it opened my eyes to a lot of what happened. Her mother, you may recall, was killed carrying a boatload of payoff money for Watergate. So uh, there, it opened my eyes to things that I never had thought about. In, that are involved in the CIA. And she always felt that her father and his group were involved in the Kennedy assassination. She said that they would discredit her. If she had credit, then she would be in danger for her life. Mm -hmm. And all of the other CIA people that she knew in the area yeah. were also, yeah, we, we hear a lot of stories, you know, the people who are in those families are the most interesting ones, and there are quite a few of them who've come forward to tell stories to say that on their deathbed, their father, their uncle, their grandfather, whatever, told them things that they were involved in. Look, I mean, what are these covert operations agencies supposed to do? That's what they do all over the world. Originally, we didn't know any of it until the church committee hearings of the 70s, and these things began to emerge, and America was shocked. America assassinates foreign leaders? You know, now we take it for granted, basically. Uh, but, but this has always been going on, and I think this, this went on in different forms before there was a CIA. I think it goes on in other countries. Uh, the, the world is a much rougher place than, than we want to believe. Okay, I'm still on the uh, theme of conspiracies. The 9-11 demolition of the buildings, like the one, the neighboring building, they all, they, I've seen many films of these, there's a film made on that kind of small change, I think. And it's called, and you see these buildings coming down like controlled de demolitions. What's your take on that? Well, I don't know. I mean, I was there when that building came down. I was standing right in front of it, not next to it, but in front of it, uh, reporting for the LA Times. And I was on the phone with an editor calling in my reporting, and I said, oh my God, that building is collapsing right in front of me. It's pancaking to me. It looks just like a, one of those things you see at a construction site. And he said, wow, the, the building just came straight down. I said, yeah. He said, oh, that, 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 <laughs> huh. You know, so look, all I can tell you is I don't think we know the full story of what happened there. I don't know what did happen there. Uh, one of the reasons I think that I, I have a good reputation is because I'm careful. Uh, I, I don't assume that, that, that uh, anything is impossible, but I don't necessarily assume that everything is the worst case scenario or the most sinister explanation. If you go to our website, Who, What, Why, you can read our first piece of reporting on 9-11, and it is about uh, uh, a house in Florida uh, that appeared to have connections to 11 of the 19 hijackers and the family that lived there and their connections into the highest levels of the Saudi royal family. That is just reporting. That's not an, uh, an agenda or an ax to grind. I'm not pro or anti. That's just uh, a story that we were able to, to, to report based on, on facts. Um, so there is much more there. Now, this is a problem because the more disturbing the story is, the more we feel we don't want to talk about it because we don't want to be made out to be fools. We don't want to be pariahs and so forth. All of these things, the Kennedy assassination, the same people who don't want to talk at all about 9-11 don't want to talk about the assass assassination of John F. Kennedy, of Robert Kennedy, of Martin Luther King. Uh, we could go on and on and on. Uh, we need to look at all of these things. We need to look at them. In your book, one of the fulcrum characters is Bob Woodward, most of us think of him differently than how he appears in your book, and he's still out there, and, and he has a chance to show us what he really is, and he, apparently he's writing a book about the debt ceiling standoff last year, and uh, Mitt Romney, after Michigan's primary, said uh, Obama's responsible for the credit downgrade, which I thought was a big reach, and the next thing I know it's being backed up. Rush Limbaugh last week, 
right. So questions about Bob Woodward? Yeah. Okay. He so he's actually still have time to show us. Right. So think. so this is a problem because we're uh, we live in a world of myth making, mm -hmm. and so uh, you know I I uh, attended and then later uh, taught at the. Columbia Graduate School of Journalism, and uh, I can tell you that if Bob Woodward shows up, there's a huge turnout. Um, they'd much rather have Bob Woodward speak anywhere than me because, not anywhere, but a lot of places because he's a big name. People show up for big names. We show up for things we know about. Uh, and there is another story to Bob Woodward, and there's another story to Watergate. Uh, I discovered it in the course of doing research. And again, this was not, you know, I grew up as a kid thinking how awful Nixon was and Woodward and Bernstein were my heroes. So you can imagine how traumatic it is for me to do research on something and then discover these antechambers of history I didn't know about. There is another story to the downfall of Richard Nixon, and it is entirely consistent with what happened to John F. Kennedy, what happened to Jimmy Carter and kept him to one term, the same kind of burden that hangs over Barack Obama, of which he is extremely aware, uh, and that is about what happens whether you're a Democrat or a Republican and you mess with what, what Eisenhower warned us about the military industrial complex, bad things happen. And I had to completely, I, I don't want to say Richard Nixon was the most wonderful human being in the world, but it turns out that he was a much more complex figure and what he was doing as president uh, and what Watergate was and what Woodward and Bernstein was, what the Washington Post was, are different stories. And it, it just, just, we don't have time here to go into that, but let me just get you to think this way. What is the Washington Post? It is a newspaper owned by very wealthy people who are best friends with, uh, they were best friends with Alan Dulles, with uh, J. Edgar Hoover, and so on. These are the people that they're spending their weekends with. So, I mean, why are we even trusting what the Washington Post puts in there as if that they're trying to give us the truth. Why would we even assume that? And, and I do think there are many good people at the Washington Post. I've written for the Washington Post. There are a lot of good people there. Uh, to have a legitimate brand, you have to do good work, but you also have people at the high levels in certain situations where they want to get a message out. Uh, in Family of Secrets, read about how Bob Woodward got his job. Read about what he was doing right before he brought Richard Nixon down. That's very, very interesting. Okay, if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll put you in the stack and come around to you right now. It's this job right here. Um, when I was living in uh, Los Angeles, I knew a friend of, of Nixon when he was living in Whittier. And when Kennedy was assassinated, he said to me, he whispered to me, it's too bad that he was assassinated, but it had to be done. There was no other way. Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I'd also like to know the relationship between the OSS and the CIA. And, and what about uh, the, the, the Yale... Uh Skull and bones. Okay, so we'd be here till tomorrow. So I'm just going to go real fast here. Um, you know about about Kennedy. Uh, there was a saying. I think it was maybe E. Howard Hunt's son said this. I can't remember. Or somebody said, um, uh, "Everybody hated the Kennedys except for the people." And John and Robert Kennedy, it turns out, were going after everybody. Now you don't hear this. You don't read this in most of the uh, best-selling big, thick history books. And there's a reason for that, because that's why those books get published. That's why those people get on to the major network shows, because they're confirming the same uh, myth, essentially. Uh, there's a lot of other information out there. I mean, Family of Secrets is only one of a number of books where you can learn about these things, all documented, all the, you know, all of the, the specifics in there. Um, uh, Kennedy, just for example, uh, uh, the, the man who owned a Sun Oil Company, um, uh, the, the Pew family now known for all of these good charitable acts of several generations later. But uh, he you know, was at a meeting at the White House and he said to, he sent to Kennedy something like, called him a son of a bitch or something like that, you know, to the President of the United States. And, and other people said to him, you know, another a friend of Joe Kennedy said to him, if your son gets out of line, uh, I think it was Henry Luce. Uh, who ran Time Life, he said, if your son gets out of line, you know, he, metaphorically he said, we're going to whack him. So you better keep your boy in line. So, yeah, I mean, th these are realities. As far as the OS and the, S and the CIA, there are a number of books about that. You can read about the, uh, the, the, the back history. What you want to look for is uh, 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 OPS, uh, Office of, uh, OPC, Office of Policy Coordination, which is not in most of the books you haven't heard of. That was the real origin of the CIA. Um, uh, basically, President Truman didn't want any, and, and Kennedy, they didn't want any CIA at all. Uh, they, didn't, they thought it was dangerous to have a secret entity like that in peacetime. 
uh, but they were assured, well, this is going to be a little tiny entity, and it's just going to be a place to uh, collect information coming in from everywhere, collate it, and give it to you when you want it. And of course, once they had the uh, proverbial nose in the uh, camel's nose in the tent, they went for the whole thing, and look what we've got today. Right. The right. The, que the question was, what do I think about the the death of uh, uh, the very progressive Senator Paul Wellstone, and that it came shortly after the death of uh, a senator in the swing state, uh, Mel Carnahan, in in Missouri. Um, you know, most journalists, and and I'm I'm, I'm listening to one of my one of my angels talking in my ear, telling me you should always say, oh, well, I don't know, because watch these shows. I mean, nobody will ever opine on any of these things. I don't know. Um, I'm interested in, in statistics, and I'm interested in, let's take all of the deaths of politicians, and let's figure out what percentage of them were pro and anti-Wall Street, of those who died in plane crashes, for example, uh, or, or, or had a particular position on whether or not to reign in the CIA. I mean, I think that's legitimate. And I, I recently had some meetings with a, a fellow who is a Nobel laureate, uh, one of the uh, um, one of the uh, smartest people in this country, and he was talking to me. He was a little afraid of the subject, but he said, that's a really good subject. That's a great uh, scientific project. Maybe we can figure out a way to work together on that. So I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think that certainly some small plane crashes are accidents and some aren't. Uh, uh, when uh, anything happens to somebody who is a, a figure of keen interest, I think we all have an obligation to do a better investigation. And what interests me about these things is it almost never happens. You remember the one in Poland where all those Polish officials died uh, sort of having a conflict with, uh, with Russia? I think all of these things, we need to look into them and we need to try to set the record straight. So why would the pilot want to die? Well, I don't think the pilot would have. It wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a kamikaze raid. I mean, <laughs> no, the, the, what we're talking about, and I mean, look, I, I talk to people who work in special ops, and they explain to me that what you do if you want a plane to go down, you know, you, you, have, a, you have a technician in there, and they do something, they, they loosen something, or they do something, and that's how it works. I mean, these things do happen. You know, there are professionals, and that's their job. Um, next question. Um, I'd like to ask, um, is it, um, with all these um, interests, um, to have a people's can candidate. Wow. And, and 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 if it isn't, uh, yeah. what would need to happen? Right. Um, like another, like the continuation of an Occupy movement, yeah. or what would generate uh, uh, a more progressive uh, sure. candidate than what we have? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. I think it, it is actually possible. Uh, I think a lot more people would have to do much more that we'd all have to put ourselves way out there uh, uh, in making this kind of thing happen. I mean, look, we all talk about the Arab Spring, but you know, they went out in the streets and they stayed there for a long time. We don't really inconvenience ourselves very much. And you know, even the Ron Paul people, you know, and, and I don't think that particular movement could ever be a majority, probably, because of eccentricities. But even those people, you know, they call themselves Ron Paul diehards, but they don't really, to my mind, they don't really do enough in their cause. And I think that um, people would have to say, you know what, I, this is really important. I'm going to dedicate a big part of my life to whatever that candidate is. You'd have to talk to your friends and you'd have to agree. And then you'd have to go through the whole process of figuring out. It's very important, by the way, that if you have candidates who are willing to talk about controversial things and propose things that are out of the mainstream, that they be credible. And uh, they have to make a good presentation. Um, I'm extremely aware of that. You know, I try to dress neatly. I try to, uh, uh, you know, I, I always say I have one foot in the mainstream and one foot out. That's very important because people look, you know, they look at somebody and they judge them. Does this person seem, uh, do, do they seem solid? And, you know, I always like to say uh, uh, the hotter the subject, the cooler the rhetoric. 
You know, and unfortunately, with all the talented people we have in this country, there really is never, I don't see any kind of a draft movement for any of thousands. You could probably think of them extremely thoughtful, articulate people. I mean, many of them could go up against uh, uh, Mitt Romney in a debate and do perfectly well. So I think we're not really taking that opportunity. If they're that smart, they don't... But when you talk about a liberal candidate, like the people that we all talk about. Who are, how do we know who is really backing them? You vote for Bernie Sanders, or you vote for some Barbara Boxer, or someone, but who is really boxing them? Uh, not boxing, I should say that. <laughs> Who's who is standing really them? backing yeah. them? <laughs> okay. What yeah. do they really stand for? Well, well, that's the job of journalism. We're supposed to do that for you. We're supposed to vet these people. Uh, and all I can tell you is I'm doing my best. That's why we started Who, What, Why. We hope when we have the resources and we can train a, a, a small bit of a new generation of journalists that that will be our mandate to go into these people and to really drill down and figure out who they are. Bernie Sanders happens to be somebody who I think is pretty much an open book. Uh, a lot of these others are not. And we elect presidents without knowing who they are. I mean, one of the themes in Family of Secrets was that George H.W. Bush had a, had a secret life uh, as an intelligence officer decades before he was brought in as CIA director uh, as an as a purported outsider. So clearly we didn't do the job on him, but in general I don't think we do the job. That, that's our responsibility. And, and, and you need to kind of vote with your feet and support the journalism that gives you a quality service, gives you the kind of information you need to figure out who these people are. Okay, this will be the last question, and uh, Russ will be here afterwards and selling his books and also take more questions. Um, I know that the votes of the people don't really matter in presidential elections. Well, who are the delegates, and why don't we know really who these delegates are, and why are they controlling the election and not the people? Uh, well, I'm not a, an expert on that process, although I, I think I actually ran for delegate when I was, uh, when I was 21 or so. Um, it is a process that anyone can actually uh, enter. If you get enough, this is one of the, I, I think, real vigorous parts of democracy, is if you go and you get enough of your friends to show up, and vote for you, you're going to be a delegate. You're not going to be a super delegate, which are the, the insiders. But if you go to a convention, and I've been to the conventions, I mean, most of the people there are ordinary folks. Um, so that's not really the problem. That's probably the best thing about the system. OK, with that, I'm sorry, we have to cut it short. That we don't, don't have enough time. But uh, as I said, Russ will be here. Help me, let's, let's thank Mr. Baker.